Welcome to Sharing the Middle, where we're covering perfectionist overachievers and anyone in the middle of a struggle come together to learn to embrace the messy middles of life. I'm Lacey, your friend in the middle and guide, whose claim to fame this week is cutting her own hair, and it actually turned out kind of good. It's a thing. I won't get into it, but just know I'm excited. Anyway, today I'm talking to Teresa Edmonds of Body Loyalty. Uh, I found her TikTok and basically fell in love with her content and message about embracing the bodies that we're in and coming from such a disability and trauma-informed approach. Really, really love this conversation with Teresa. Let's jump in. Welcome, Teresa. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I found you on TikTok in a time that I desperately needed you. I have been going through a health journey. My body has changed a lot with chronic illness. I still don't officially know what it is, but I'm just kind of running with chronic fatigue syndrome, ME-CFS, because it Mm -hmm. seems to fit generally the best for me. Um, Me too, by the way. (laughs) We're tired, but we're around. We're tired, but we're mighty. (laughs) And it's really interesting because this process that I've been going through It actually has been healing for me and my body because Mm -hmm. I've always been a bigger woman. I've always been at odds with my body and having to actually stop and listen to it has been huge for me. When I I came across your content, it was just so eye-opening for me. And so one, just thank you for creating it. I really appreciate it. And thank you for creating it in a space that's not a vacuum because I'm a good white lady is what I always like to say. And I always tried to do my best to not offend anybody and not hurt, you know, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I learned very easily that, oh, that just means I ignore people and I ignore parts of society and whatnot. And it took my disability to really grasp that, you know, for people like us who are this close to power, it often takes having so more of our power removed before you finally get the bigger picture of what's going on for everybody else. Absolutely. And I love that your model and that body loyalty really looks at all of it and brings it into one space. So I really appreciate that. Instead of me just continuing to fangirl, (laughs) why don't you take it to introduce yourself to our listeners in your own words? Thank you. Oh, gosh, this is so nice. I'm Teresa Edmonds. I'm the creator of Body Loyalty. I call myself the creative visionary of Body Loyalty. (laughs) And it's this philosophy that I have created that addresses body hate and self-care from a trauma-informed, disability-informed, and systems-informed point of view. Because I have had an a real wild journey. I've had one of those life stories where you ask me like two personal questions and I have to start bringing you into the trauma. And <laughs> so I have just been on this like 30 year journey, honestly, from birth, but 15 was when I really started entering like therapy and things like that. So yeah. it's been like a 30 year journey as like a close to a professional patient, you know, Absolutely. and that has left a few marks. That is a really rough experience to go through. And so I have all these years of searching and searching through everything, you know, everything, religion, self-help, like literally everything on this huge searching quest to try to find some kind of answers for myself. And I finally just determined they're not out there. They're just not because we have some things that are helpful for some people But none of those things address trauma. None of them address disability. None of them address systems. And in my mind, if you hate your body, those are the reasons. You hate your body because of the experience you are having living in your body that is impacted by trauma, disability, and systems of oppression. And so we have all of these wonderful... I've worked with so many clinicians who are wonderful. So I have a lot of criticism for all, every system, every system. And just wait till you hear some of my criticisms about like wellness predators. I've got criticisms for everybody, but I also recognize there are some really good faith, noble, talented people doing their very best in within these systems. And I saw just how hard they were working, but even they acknowledged they're not changing things for anybody. They've got all of this stuff about affirmations and self-love and self-compassion and all the stuff that has been helpful to me, especially along the way, but it can't resolve anything. 
Because ultimately, the reason we feel this way is not because we just don't like ourselves enough for some mysterious reason. It's because the experience we are having as human beings in our bodies is often deeply unpleasant because of trauma, disability, and systems of oppression. Mm -hmm. And so really changing that in a long-term sustainable way means getting all the way down to the root of our experiences with a body. And so a lot of what I talk about is honestly just starting at the beginning, which is you are going to be disabled and you are going to die. These are just the facts. We didn't choose it. We just arrived on this planet one day and this is the only way it's going to work for any of us. And that is just a fact. And you know, when you have privilege and power, it is so easy to ignore that and pretend it doesn't happen and take wild risks. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm obsessed with this submarine story <laughs> and just taking absolutely wild risks because they have so much power and privilege. They don't have to pay attention to the fact that yeah. they have a mortal body. We are just like sacks of goo with computers on top. And it is astonishing how quickly things can go wrong and how many different ways for us that people just ignore because as soon as you start having health issues, you get segregated. You and really so do. we are all staying in our houses. My son uses a wheelchair. Most of the places in this world we can't go. So when you do have to accept your disabilities, you are just cast aside. You are tossed away by society, no matter how much power and privilege you had before that. I really have to challenge people because it's really fundamental worldviews that need to change. Viewing our bodies as status objects, which I believe is the default for most of us. We are just like passively learning as children. Oh, when my body looks this way, I'm treated better. When my body looks that way, I'm not. If I'm prettier, if I perform this kind of gender, if I have my skin tone this way or whatever, all of these hierarchies that we have based on our bodies. We have to fundamentally decouple those and stop using our bodies as status objects, as objects to achieve more status mm -hmm. and actually start treating ourselves like we are human beings. It's so hard. It's so <laughs> hard to do. And so like I have two toddlers. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And these are conversations that my husband and I deeply have about what we are saying about our children's body to them with them, around them. When I was somewhere with family and someone told me my nieces that she like, oh, did you lose weight? And I, mm -hmm. I just had this, I knew, like I yeah. knew what that could be. And I actually was like, how do you feel? Do you feel good? And later my niece came to me and said, thanks for saying that because she understood that I was being conscious in that moment and that I was trying. And so it's just, and that person had great intentions. It was not, of course, you know right? what I mean? It's just one of those things where it's so ingrained. Yeah. Into it's everything. so conditioned. We really have to examine everything. every piece of our conditioning in order to build a life that actually prioritizes us. Mm -hmm. It's really shocking to think about how many of us are living lives that do not prioritize us as in our body needs as in the material needs we need to meet. We are just denying ourselves food and sleep and rest and bathroom breaks and all of these things, then wondering why we're so unhappy and miserable all the time. <laughs> like many of us are going to such ridiculous lengths, using substances, overwork, over exercise, all of these stimulations to distract ourselves from the human experience of having a body and create, and we're so often socially rewarded for that. Absolutely. Like extreme athletes, so rewarded, even though it is very well documented what marathons can do to a body. It is very well documented what like ultra running and Ironmans, like those things can result in long-term injuries, but we celebrate this because the, that is our social conditioning. It goes back to the status object once again. And it's always about performance instead of our own experience of what it feels like inside the body. Absolutely. And it's like performance plus cultural expectation. Mm -hmm. And, that, you know, because so I, as you mentioned, athletes, I watched a TikTok on someone talking about trans women in sports and it was a female athlete. And she said, look, bodies having an advantage is in every sport right. and everything. <laughs> the reason why Michael Phelps 
was the greatest, I don't know, the greatest swimmer all time will say, is because his body was built like that. Yes, Mm -hmm. he put in the work. He did what he needed to do, that kind of stuff. But he already had that advantage. So Mm -hmm. looking at it from this lens is ridiculous. And so that made me really step back of, as you were talking, like, man, it's an everything. It's (laughs) everywhere. It is everywhere. When I was starting with body loyalty, I thought that I was only going to speak from my own experience. And the furthest I get into it, I was like, no, this literally has to touch on everything, every aspect of having a body, Mm -hmm. because it really comes down to some fundamental things with how our society is set up. And it really does go all the way back to colonialism and slavery. Capitalism is built on the belief that human bodies are capital. Our human bodies are where we get our money from. And that did not change when slavery was outlawed. That did not change with the, at the end of Jim Crow. That is everywhere still to this day. That is in hustle culture, grind culture. That is in who gets rewarded and who doesn't. That It's everywhere. We are still viewing our bodies as our way of making it through the world, of acquiring material goods and elevating ourselves in society and instead of anything about, yeah, what we actually need. I, it's everywhere. There's something about. It's everywhere. And it's funny because it's such a good statement. When I talk about the middle, once I start to talk about it, people are like, oh, it's everything. So yeah. I, so when I talk about the middle or say the middle, what does that look like to you? What does that mean? I well, find people funny. tend to have because this visceral, this is what it is for me. I did. And my reaction was, it's everything. <laughs> I say it all the time that there is no destination. This experience yeah. you are having, that is your life right now. This is it. We are in the middle. It is always the middle. And I also talk because I've had... Some not super common life experiences that have really forced me to reckon with some of the hard things about being human. And doing so has really taught me that there is no moment in your life where things are going to be like, phew, okay, got through it all. The rest, we're just coasting. To enjoy your life, you really have to develop the skill to be able to navigate the full complexity. You have to develop the skill to thrive in the middle. Because it is always the middle. There's always going to be times when you have hard things pressed right up against the good things. And often it's the hard things that make the good things the sweeter they are. Like that is just what it means to be a person. And the more you can accept that and learn those kind of navigation skills, I think the more satisfactory your whole life will be. Yeah, I agree. I'm still not great at it, but dang it. I'm- <laughs> I think it's this, the journey of your whole life. I, I feel know. like the day I finally go, phew, got it. Then I'm just going to keel over dead. I do usually like to ground our conversation in the specific moment that we then mm-hmm. bridge off into a million different things. So is there a kind of middle moment that oh, you would want to talk about? Oh, man, there's so many. The first one that I, there's one I often tell that's like an impetus for body loyalty. But what's really coming to my mind today is actually my birth experience. I don't know that I really talked about that a ton, but I went through eight years of infertility before I got pregnant with my son Atticus and actually stayed pregnant long enough to have any kind of a birth experience. But I still only made it to 27 weeks and I oh. had to have emergency C section. We both came as close to a bad ending as you can. And we made it through. Okay. And I think that moment was one of those moments in life where I seriously, literally nearly died on the table. So it was a literal near-death experience, (laughs) not just the near-death experience of me, but really giving birth to Atticus because 27 weeks, he was extremely premature, two pounds, three ounces. He was in the NICU for the, the full rest of the three months. He was discharged on his due date and he has lived with disabilities as a result of his prematurity. And I think him, like being ushered into being his mother is really what allowed me to start learning and embracing disability. Let me back up so I can give you the proper context. In 1999, I got mono and I have been sick ever since. And I did not realize it was ME-CFS until last year. So I have just had this mystery sickness all this time and all these different diagnoses, yada, yada, yada. But because it was this big question mark, I would never have dreamed in a million years of calling myself disabled. That just felt like, and I know I hear this from people all the time, that feels like stolen valor or something. Like I don't deserve it. 
there are other people are suffering. Right, exactly. And so being his mom ushered me into the disability community in a way that my own disabilities did not. I was still wrapped up with all these internalized ableist beliefs. But as his mom, the, one of the first things I did was get on Twitter and look for adults who had his disabilities and tried to learn to navigate this through hearing what they wish something had done, somebody yeah. had done in their lives, learning because he is nonverbal, I needed people who could explain his experience to me. And through that process, the disability community gave me such a beautiful mentorship and support and education. And somewhere along the way, I finally went, hang on, I think this might apply to me too. And from that point forward, it allowed me just so much freedom from shame. I didn't have to question myself of, am I trying hard enough? Am I faking it? That's a huge one until you have a diagnosis. I think it all the time. Is this all in my head? I can't move my arms right now, but maybe I can. Maybe I'm just not trying hard enough. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Right? They're just tortured with all these thoughts. And once I finally realized, I don't need a diagnosis to be disabled. The definition of disability is just if you have a medical condition that impacts one or more of your major life functions. That's it. It does not say you have to have this, you have to be diagnosed by this list of disorders and then you qualify. No, it just means that you have a medical condition that's making your life harder. And yeah, that qualified. And so I could stop saying no, just all of those internal shame messages that you that are very easy to embrace when you are also grieving what your body can't do. When you are grieving the loss of your own abilities. And then you have other people just in society, in your life, in the media, whatever, saying these people are fakers. These people don't deserve help. These people don't deserve basic public health protections. It is so easy. I don't know if it's even possible not to internalize those messages and think, I don't deserve safety. I don't deserve this. But by being part of the disability community, you know, I could believe all kinds of horrible things about myself, but I couldn't believe about them. And I sure as hell could not believe it about my son. Like people could say all the horrible things about disability in the world, but no force on this planet was going to be able to convince me that was true about Atticus. And so believing these things, it it was like one of those logic problems where you have to do the transitive properties. Is it true here? Right, exactly. And this and this are the same. (laughs) Right. If Atticus has worth, then I had to do this whole thing before I could start to think maybe I'm not like, an irredeemable human being. Maybe I am actually worth some effort for some basic self-care. And it really was like learning to see the version of myself, like Addie's mom, that part of me, when I could not take care of myself, I could take care of Addie's mom because I had love and affection for the version of myself that he looked at like that. Oh, Oh. What a distinction that really just hit me to the core. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I only I I say constantly on social media everything I learned from Atticus because I was so deep in my own conditioning. We are all so conditioned that I couldn't see any of this until I started seeing it through his eyes. And an enormous part of that is Atticus is autistic. <laughs> and if you start questioning social norms because you have to start explaining them to an autistic child. It will not take you long before you go, hold up. None so of us make any so sense at all. So dumb. <laughs> any sense at all. I just Come went on. on a rant about small talk and how I think small talk is like has this weird set of rules that no one seems to like. So why are we all doing it that way? I don't understand. It's just, yeah, the way things are done. And so everybody's like going along, get along. But we don't have to. We don't have to, especially if you are somebody who has some access to power and privilege. Like Mm -hmm. the only function of privilege, it's not to make those of us who have it just feel guilty and just like wander around carrying this guilt. Guilt is useless to anybody. The only function of privilege is to be able to flex it on behalf of people who don't have it in order to make change. So if you are somebody who has access to power and privilege, you are somebody who can say at work, we need to be paid for our overtime or we need to work fewer hours and face fewer consequences than somebody else. So like my husband and I were even joking about it this morning when I was talking to Atticus because Atticus is beautiful. And so I was telling him this morning, I know it feels scary sometimes when people like to stare at you, but that's actually a power and you can use it to teach people 
so they won't be so scared about disability. And we were joking about that whole Spider-Man thing, like with great power comes great responsibility. It's a, it's just true. And so if you are somebody who can sacrifice some of that without intense consequence, then I feel like that is the duty. That is the only point. That is the only thing to do with any of this. Otherwise, you're we're just like harming people with it or just carrying needless guilt. I so, love that. I love that because I think a lot of times because our society wants to be so individualistic, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, a lot of times the default is I suffered, so somebody else has to suffer. And so instead of using that privilege of I suffered and I got to this place, instead, I got to this place and I want to help get people to where I am, I think is a much better view for everybody. I learned in elementary school that we were building a powerful future. So I don't know what happened in between there and and now that people thought we weren't doing that anymore, but we are in fact still building a powerful future. And so if we want to live in a world that doesn't hurt us so much, then Mm -hmm. that takes work. And that takes this kind of work. Really what I am teaching through body loyalty is just humanization. It is learning how to view yourself as a human and address your human needs. And people like us who do tend to have power and privilege, the reason the dehumanization we commit towards other groups is invisible to us is because of our own dehumanization. If we learn to humanize ourselves and take care of ourselves, we will see humanity everywhere. And that's a reciprocal relationship. It's that logic problem again. By seeing the humanity in my disabled son, I could eventually turn that around and learn to see the humanity in myself. But it really is those relationships are tied because these are skills. These are emotional tools that we need to develop of things like perspective taking and giving the benefit of the doubt and finding some compassion and conflict resolution, all of sitting in the discomfort. All of these things are tools and skills that have to be practiced. They don't just you don't just come with them. They're not like character traits. And so it really, it takes work to develop that, but that is the secret to a life that feels good to live, even if you have disabilities. And I, one, thank you, because you don't know this, but you just gave me permission for something I've been beating myself up about. As I mentioned before, like I am a privileged white lady. I come from a very solid middle class background. I have a really awesome husband who still has his job, even though I lost mine. We had a savings that we saved because we did. That's what you were supposed to do, those things. Mm -hmm. And we, if I didn't have one of those things, Mm -hmm. my entire life would be different right now. I have no doubt in my mind And I did all the right things, quote unquote. And I just keep thinking about if I put myself on a poster that more people like me can look at me and be like, oh, she did all the right things and this still happened to her. I was actually making a lot more money this last year than I was before. And Mm -hmm. our taxes went way up. But I lost my job before we paid our taxes. So guess who had a giant tax bill who had to borrow money from her parents to be able to do that? But guess what? I Mm -hmm. could do that. I had that privilege. But I had this moment of I don't want to be some kind of like disability savior because that's not (laughs) my role. But if I could have other people who look like me and be like, that happened to you, someone who did all the checkmark right things Mm -hmm. and it still happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've been messing around with how to talk about it in a way to do that. Because I think it is easier when we see people like us going through something. And so Unfortunately, just, that does seem to be the way I most know. of us can enter something. I wish it wasn't that way, but I haven't solved it. So yeah, I so know. I just I've been so hearing you say, no, this is our privilege. Use your experience and your privilege to share to lift others. I'm like, all right, Mm -hmm. yep, I got to do this. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah. because whiteness is so individualistic, like you were saying. And so when we do hit those moments, we have nothing. Like as soon as we need some kind of care we can't provide for ourselves, there's nothing there because we're just one, we're an individual. And as a matter of fact, we have put more barriers to people getting what they need. And this is something that I've said over and over again to the people in my world. I'm like, I don't think you understand. I can't get disability because of X, Y, and Z. And so I can't get support because of all of these barriers we put into place because you're worried about one person taking advantage of it instead of the people who get help from it. Yeah. 
denying so many people who need help and creating this monstrosity of a bureaucracy that requires so much money to run all to keep a couple people from getting support they might not technically yeah. Which, require. If they're going through all those steps, they were going to get that money no matter what. <laughs> and <laughs> the amount of work. money we're talking about, <laughs> oh, man, it's just, it really, it's none of it is really about that. We have all of these stories that are covering pretty ugly truths underneath, which is just that our society is built to exploit us. It is not built to give us a rewarding experience. I keep track of so many different things, whether it's from the middle, no shame in the home game, all of the different business ventures that are part of those things. And I also keep track of a lot of things in our household from things that we need to repair and do and flows, all of that stuff. The thing that I use to do all of that is Notion. Notion is this amazing blank slate where you build your own app and database depending on what you need. They have some amazing templates to help you get started. But once you get in there and start using it, you see how things work and come together. It is magic and easy and beautiful. It's like a to-do list meets a database with workflows. And then you can even get AI right into Notion to help you come up with words when words are hard, because let's be honest, they are. We have a link for Notion to help you potentially if you go to themiddle.com. So that's T H E M D D L.com backslash Notion, N O T I O N. You can get a link into Notion and potentially sign up for a plan. Now, they do have free plans and paid plans. If anything, go get a free plan because it is so cool and you'll fall in love like me and become a Notion advocate. If you have a few minutes today, if you could take a moment and review Sharing the Middle, that would be such a huge help. Reviews help people find us and show that Sharing the Middle is a podcast worth listening to, which obviously I think it is. So if you're on Apple Podcasts, head on over to Sharing the Middle homepage and you can leave a five-star review. Thanks for your support. So I really would like to go back, though. It's another thing that and we're just going to keep talking about things that are I love it. to me. It's, <laughs> it's my it. podcast, so we can do that. <laughs> I'm just so curious because this is something I am struggling with. And being disabled and a mother mm -hmm. is very challenging. Oh, babe, it is so hard. It really and I, is. It's something that I hear no one talk about. Yeah, Literally, no. I posted no. a thing on TikTok saying, any moms who have ME-CFS, please, what do you do? How do you do it? Because managing my energy to be with my children is so challenging. It really is. Being with my children brings me the most joy in the world, but it also is the most draining. How do people make it work? It was crickets. I'm not surprised because you know what? This is, remember, I'm a community organizer and I am a disability yeah. activist. So sometimes yeah. some of the things I say, if people don't have any background in that might sound hyperbolic, but no, this is honest, literal truth. People have reason to worry having their children taken away from them. That's true. So they have to, we all have to be careful as parents how we discuss this. Now, I have a lot of power and privilege. So this is one way that I choose to exercise that power and privilege. I don't have to fear that, not only because of who I am, but also, unfortunately, again, because of who Atticus is. And so this is, I'm very public with a lot of my health conditions and strategies because I can afford to be like, that is, this is my praxis. Mm -hmm. Like talking about this stuff pu publicly is me like exercising the theory I believe in. But so to answer your question, I would say the two things that really come to mind, first of all, is lowering expectations yeah. and then getting really creative with playtime. I have absolutely no mom guilt, zero, Abs so little mom guilt. I forget how much of a role it plays in other women's lives. And I really feel like that's because since the time Addie was born, I knew that our journey was not going to look like anybody else's. Yeah. And so I just needed to keep my eyes on my own work and make sure my kid was happy and loved and satisfied. And that was my only measure. And so what that looks like between the two of us is strictly like how it works for the two of us. And so I don't care if I don't make meals from scratch. I don't care if I'm not part of the PTA. I don't care if I'm not 
running him to a million different activities. Like none of that matters because in our lives, we live so close to like close to the bone. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we have to live so deep in the reality of healthcare. And one of us is going to need another surgery now. And one of like, just that's such a fact in our lives. We just can't pretend otherwise. And so we just focus on what we need because we've been cast aside by society. So we don't have to play by their rules. We just do what works for us. And so- I'm sorry, I laugh because of just how I know, right? <laughs> you're just like, no one else cares. So I'm like, oh, that is how I get through life. I have the darkest sense of humor because it's all absurd. All of this is just absurd. That it's true. So yeah, I use absolutely zero external metrics. I yeah. only focus on if my kid is safe and loved. And that is what I measure my success in parenting by. I don't have to worry about his success in school because most of the people in a school have like less than zero expectations. Of so it, it really is like a mixed bag for me. Mm-hmm. And I choose to focus on the few good things that come along in a big sack of unpleasantness. <laughs> but there is so much freedom involved in just recognizing that you don't have to do things their way at all. They have said they don't want us. So we can do things our own way and abandon every bit of shame. And so that means that we play a lot of games called mama take a nap where he puts me to sleep. We play Doc McStuffins where he gives me a checkup. We play just all of these silly games that I can do while I'm laying down and all of these strategies that we've come up with that work between the two of us for how we're going to get by together. And that does take a lot of creativity, but more than creativity, it takes the ability to let go of the conditioning because it is so powerful to think, oh, my son is in the top 10% of his class. What is his future going to look like? And the truth is, you have no idea even if he was in the top 10% of his class. Like I have people who regularly look at me in Atticus and say out loud to my face, are you afraid that he's never going to leave your house and be independent? And I just, I have started looking back at them and going, how do you know that yours are? Because one of the deeply unpleasant things about parenting is that we have no control over these outcomes. And if you stop running from that scary fact and just learn to live with it as a fact, then once again, it will give you freedom because (laughs) You don't have to do things any different. That's also embracing the middle right there, though. It's not worrying about the future. It's worrying about the now. And there's a lot of beauty in that. I also, it's different when it's somebody that you know and love and they want Mm -hmm. to get to know you better. I like, I would, when it comes to infertility, this is something that I've always said. If I ask people, because I'm curious Mm -hmm. about, is this something that you want? If it's not cool, like it's about me getting to know you and what you want your life to look like and that kind of thing. It's Mm -hmm, not, mm -hmm. are you meeting these expectations? I always like to separate those things out because I'm a genuinely curious person and I know I will never not ask that question. And like me, if you and I became best friends, I could ask, is this a fear you have or are you worried about the future? Exactly. a random person? First time meeting her. (laughs) Really? People are so terrified of disability. They are so terrified of it that they just lose sense. They really do. And they just start projecting their fear on you if you are visibly disabled. People people are wild. People are wild. But I think it's not exactly easy to confront mortality. That's not Not. fun. But it is, I think, like the key to being able to relax and enjoy the experience of living and embrace what comes your way and stop being so rigid and controlling over something that you're just setting yourself up to fail. Like by definition, you can't control any of this. I love that. I'm going to be thinking about that all day. (laughs) This is all very near and dear to me because I have figured out that this is part of my life's mission and I haven't Mm -hmm. figured it out exactly what it looks like yet. (laughs) I do want to talk a little bit about body loyalty. Yes, please. That it has, I was on the website the other day and looking through the different kind of areas, marrows, and I think, I forget the exact wording and I should have pulled it up before this. Like step one mm-hmm. is, what's step one? Oh, maybe. Is, do you mean quiet? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so body loyalty, and I, I think of it as like in two parts. And one, we've been talking about is questioning our conditioning. And the second is, okay, then 
how do I care for myself? Yeah. And the problem, of course, is that all of our bodies are so individual that you can't talk to some stranger on the internet and have them tell you how to care for yourself. And unfortunately, you also can't go to your doctor and in 15 minutes have them tell you everything you need to know to take care of yourself either. So we have this double bind that makes us so vulnerable to all kinds of bad actors out there. And as I'm watching my disability community, I'm just like, we need some tools. So yeah. the second half of body loyalty is the scaffolding tool that kind of creates this screening method for how you can evaluate your healthcare choices. And it's divided up to a affect each different area of your health needs. So the first step is rest and recovery. Mm -hmm. And then there's mental health, emotional health, physical health, and social health. Like all of those things, you have needs in all of those departments. They all impact the other. You're never going to be happy if your mental health is garbage. You're never going to be physically healthy if you're emotional. All of these things work together. So they all have to be met. So I divide it up based on what the intention is that we're going for, some mindset things that need to change, and then what it is that we actually do. So the marrows are what I call these like intentions governing each of these areas of health. So for our rest and recovery needs, the marrow is quiet. And that really started for me because that's where my individual journey started is being trapped in bed, recovering from surgery after surgery after surgery. So I was like trapped in quiet mm -hmm. and forced to really face myself when I literally could not get out of bed there's no place to go, but listen to your thoughts and just have this reckoning with myself. And that's what built out everything else went off of that recovery journey. But I feel like quiet is the place to begin your emphasis because it's how you can, first of all, just recover. You can't do anything if you have no resources to do it with. And then to reconnect with your experience of sensation. Because a lot of us, for a lot of different reasons, have learned that it is best to dissociate from our body experience entirely and just live in our heads. And if we do that, in short term, it can be a very adaptive solution. But long term, it also means that you can't feel any of your symptoms when it's time to go to the doctor. You can't feel any of your sensory joys that your body is rewarding you with. And you just can't feel that sense of home in yourself. And so yet then there's additional, it's a whole chart that <laughs> goes on from there to address all of these other health needs as a way of kind of examining, is that choice that's presented to you, whatever it is, however you found it, is that the thing that's actually going to bring you the results that you need in your life based on your circumstances with you, your resources? Or is it just going to be the next thing that you shame yourself with because you feel like, oh, here I am again, not able to make this thing work. And I'm such a mom. When really it's the intervention that failed. It was the wrong intervention for your circumstances. So instead of internalizing this shame, it's just finding this different way to think about it, that we are conducting these experiments and trying to figure out what approach, what intervention is going to be the thing that creates the accommodations we need in our life. Because really this whole thing is just disability theory. Yeah. It is teaching you how to create accommodations in your life so that you can meet your own needs that are not being met already. And it's all done without shame. And that's, I, I have a second podcast that I'm producing. It's called No Shame in the Home Game. And it comes <laughs> down to having no shame in how your house runs, meeting yeah. your needs and coming up with practical solutions instead of wallowing in the, this is the way things should be done. Right. And I'm just like, this all makes sense and it's related. <laughs> <laughs> <That's so exciting. laughs> One, but two, I love this idea of, I think we are always trying to fix Mm -hmm. Fix, fix, fix. So I love that the idea of step one is to shut up. Yeah. Quiet. And I think the the recover also really yeah. hit me hard. Of you're okay. Like you're okay mm -hmm. where you are. Just accept that. That really hit me very hard. One, because I'm like, oh, that's what I've been doing. Like my body forced me to. That's how I feel too. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like, <laughs> you've been in charge of this long enough and you're getting this all wrong. We're yeah. in charge now. <laughs> but I will say like the... It's amazing to me how much I desensitize my body to so many things. Like I always used to think intuitive eating was this most like this huge made up thing. Hey. And it truly has changed me. So I have started listening to my body so much better that now yeah. I have eaten 
healthier. Like I have more vegetables than I've ever had before when I was trying to beat myself up to diet. Mm-hmm, and it's because mm-hmm. I've actually been quiet to listen to yeah. my body and what it needs and being okay with the whole of it all. It's so powerful and it's we walk around so blinded that yeah. you can't see how much we've been conditioned to not no. do those things. No, you really can't. Like we are just trained to see our body as a burden, you know, and you'll hear people talking about it all the time. Can't wait to be free of this meat suit. Bodies are so inconvenient and meats are inconvenient. So I'm not going to deny that, but your body is a living creature. Like most of us treat our dogs better than we treat our bodies. My dog is a king right now. (laughs) In my rest practice, specifically in my sensation practice, creating a persona for my body was hugely impactful because just the same with Atticus, I could do things for my son. I couldn't do for myself. I can take care of a pet horse air quotes in a better way that I was ever willing to take care of myself. And it, as this persona, as I like lived into this persona, it's become really profound and spiritually meaningful to me having this, like, I will get really emotional and moved thinking about the love I have for my body now when I think of it, this body as something separate from me, but still a part of me, a Mm -hmm. part of me and a part from me, like it is not in my control. It is still me, obviously, but it is not in my control. And so creating this persona was a way to reflect that, that lack of control I had. I'm just negotiating with nature when I am trying to deal with my body. And if a sickness is going to come. A sickness is going to come. That's just how things are. And I can take care of myself by giving myself the dignity that I would give to a living creature, even when I find that dignity hard to extend to myself. So you've already given a thousand practical <laughs> pieces of advice, but I do like to end. Is there a piece of advice that you're like, I didn't get to say this, or oh, this wow. is something I wish someone would have said to me, or maybe this is something I've lived by that's been really helpful? Yeah, basically that is everything I do. I always say I am all praxis. I'm not yeah. a therapist. I don't have any licensure. All I have to offer is praxis. And so I think what the most, if I was going to boil everything down, I would say the whole body loyalty point is that to take care of yourself first of all, I'd say maybe the whole body loyalty point is that you are a human being and you have needs and you deserve to have those needs met with dignity. We all do. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes, how do we meet those needs? You don't need to do every single thing. You don't have to have a gratitude journal and a processing journal and therapy twice a week and a perfect diet and this exercise. And you know that's never going to be sustainable. To have some kind of a sustainable way of taking care of yourself, just try coming up with seven different, no, five different practices. Sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six. No, I was right the first time I had them written differently. (laughs) Seven, seven different practices and something that meets each of those needs. So something that fits into your life that you don't hate doing that meets your need for rest, meets your need for breath, meets your need for awareness, which is learning how Mm -hmm. your brain works, meets your need for reflection, thinking about what you're doing and why. And if you want to keep doing it that way, your needs for movement, your needs for nourishment, and your needs for caregiving. You just find something you can do in each of those categories. That's all you need to do to take care of yourself. That's it. Everything else, that's other people trying to sell you stuff. But just meeting those needs will be enough. Awesome. How can people find you? Is there anything that you want to point people to that type of thing? Bodyloyalty.com. I have a newsletter there and a blog post there. I do TikToks just about every morning. I'm Body Loyalty on TikTok, Body Loyalty on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I think that's Body Loyalty Movement. So if you're a Facebook user, you can find me there too. Yeah, just all over the place trying to a a Patreon that's almost never used these days. (laughs) How how to talk about this in a way that makes sense to people. So yeah, appreciate any feedback. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. I had a great time. Thanks for sharing the middle with me. As always, I hope you've been able to see a little bit of yourself and the story we shared today. Don't forget to follow, share, rate, review, and follow me on social media at Lacey Shares. 
You can always check out the Joyful Support Movement at joyfulsupportmovement.com and see all of the amazing goodness we have there, like No Shame in the Home Game, Pops of Joy, courses, resources, and of course, the Joyful Support Village. All right, now go out there and spread some joy.